Hello, everyone, and good evening, and welcome to the Rubin Museum of Art. I'm Tim McHenry, Deputy Executive Director here and Chief Programmatic Officer, the longest title in the world, and we welcome you to this museum that really is a global hub for Himalayan art with a little home base in the foothills of Chelsea, so welcome. So we're exploring some major questions tonight. Tomorrow afternoon, for example, we'll be posing the question to the assembled audience uh, in a totally darkened room, and we'll ask the question, who wants to die without knowing who they really are? And in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the dark retreat practice is a 49-day practice in which all sources of light is removed from your world. And when all the light has gone, everything you see is you. And it's not always convenient, and it's not always beautiful. In fact, it's very often the reverse. So that's a preparation for the dying process. And uh, Death is Not the End is an exhibition that runs through to uh, the early part of January next year. I urge you to go and see it. The galleries are open till 10 o'clock. But what we wanted to talk about tonight and in this series with our host, Amanda Palmer, is what happens, what is the life after you tell the truth on yourself for the benefit of others. And that becomes a pivotal moment in anybody's life. And here on stage tonight, we're going to witness two extraordinary storytellers who do not fabricate stories. They use stories to tell the truth and transmit an understanding and a perspective that has often been obscured by things like the media. And Noor Taguri is no stranger to the misconception that can arise through media dissemination of information that is far from truthful. And as an award-winning uh, journalist and podcaster and truth teller, she has really been trenchant about holding that line and bringing the truth to bear on a situation where she sees it. And quite frankly, no differently, Amanda Palmer is a truth teller, but in song. And so here we have these two storytellers together who are going to pass this out and reveal how difficult it is and what the price you have to pay is when you tell the truth on yourself. So first up, hands together for Amanda Palmer. Dresses and records and books And a lot of the time I never see them again And in a weird way I think that that works Because the thing about things Is they start to turn evil When you start to forget what they're for so if you're not sure what you did with my sweater, I'll just have to love you a little bit more. I had a ring that belonged to my grandfather. He was a mason and gay and he was distant and bitter for all of my childhood we never had much to say he wasn't tight to give tokens of affection so I stole the ring when he died and then 20 years Because the 
thing about things is that they can start meaning things nobody actually said. And if he couldn't make something mean something for me, I had to make up what it meant. To mourn the loss of what it cost, I think it's a poem, and I think it keeps going. And I've borrowed and loaned lots of things, and three nights ago. In the bar where I lost it, the bartender gave me the ring. And I lay in bed with my phone in my hand, thinking, what can I fix with which app? And I call my grandfather, he doesn't answer. start meaning things nobody actually said and if you're not allowed to love the people alive then you learn how to love the people dead the thing about things is that they can start meaning things nobody actually said and if you're not allowed to love people alive then you learn how to love people dead Please put your hands together for Noor. Hi, beautiful friends. You know it would be so fun, oh. <laughs> Guys, I think I dropped, I may have dropped my poem in the back. I did memorize it, wait, one. <laughs> the truth is I did memorize it like when I was 17 and then it all came back to me. I'm, oh, the poem is what I'm talking about. Um, hi beautiful friends. I am so honored that you all are here. 
can we just get another round of applause for Amanda's moving music? And Tim, thank you so much for having us. This is just so beautiful. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي This is a Muslim and also recently I was told it's also similar to a Jewish prayer um, that was said by Moses He in our tradition we believe that he had a lisp and uh, the translation of the prayer is O oh Lord please open and expand my heart Make my task easy for me and untie the knots in my tongue so they may understand what I truly mean to say. So I pass that prayer on to you guys because today is a night of truth telling and I pray that your hearts are open enough for sharing. Um, my name is Noor and I've been a journalist for exactly 15 years of my life. I turned 30 next week, and I started when I was 15, so. Um, but I wrote this poem that I wanted to share with you all because poetry was what was like a medium of art that I used since I was a child to try to make sense of things when like natural storytelling couldn't. And it was one of those things where like the line would just like come in your mind in the shower and then everything would come out. And sometimes I would write words that I didn't even know what they meant. And now I'm realizing 12 years later that this poem that I wrote in 2011, one month into the Arab Spring and the Libyan Revolution, which is where my family is from, Libya, um, that this poem was a gift that was waiting for me as an adult too. So I wanted to share it with you all. Uh, it's called Deaf, Dumb, and Blind. And it's a reference to a verse in the Quran that uh, refers to these ailments through a spiritual lens. So, unfortunately, that's the limited translation in English, but here we go. <clears throat> Y'all, I haven't performed poetry in 10 years, so this is like... <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 I'm right. Let's continue to work. Look at this friend. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Oh, so it wasn't for me, it was for you. It's fine, it's fine, guys, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, 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 serious. This is a serious poem. Okay. <clears throat> My stomach is full, but I am starving. The aching want of food for my hungry eyes hurts from the force-feeding tubes of mainstream media lies. And the hunger shapeshifts into vulnerable slices, into vulnerable ears that want a satisfying slice of the truth. Tempted... We bite the sugar-coated hand that feeds us and choke as we learn that not everything is served on a silver platter. And while everyone has his or her hands on a piece, the truth remains scattered. No one's eyes have the audacity or the mental capacity to witness the reality that fate is fatality. Our mentally acquired taste favors the buds of ignorance. As the ulcers in our eyes grow, it has become impossible to visualize mercenaries sent out to massacre, leaving maimed corpses brutalized. An image that mother media has made numb to those with no ties to the land that reeks the scent of death. As she allows ignorant minds to suckle lies through her breast. Meanwhile, reality never takes a rest and brave men catch bullets with their bare chest. Their blood runs parallel to the stream of the Nile, refusing to cut the umbilical tie to the motherland so they sleep with one eye open, never having peace of mind because they give a piece of their mind. Yet the only sound heard in the transaction of words between the leader and the rebel is the universal language of gunshots spoken with machine gun mouths and 12 gauge tongues. And when they pray, this is the language that is sung. Worship in the most prominent religion today, self-interest, where brutal practice to obtain paper and plastic persists. Man sacrifices human blood to this worship, and instead of feeling pure after prayer, 
The dirt stays embedded underneath the fingernails of hands that have touched so much impurity. But when night falls, darkness paints the skies with stars in a handwriting of a God who knows the golden silence and the quiet in truth. And this is why they never tell you the truth. This is why they feed you lies on a silver platter and tell you, you are not worthy of gold, you are not worthy of God, and you are not worthy of fact. Well, here's a fact. 90% of human communication is nonverbal, so maybe I should stay silent. Mother Media tells me that silence is golden, but I have seen the color of silence. Silence is blue that turns bright red the moment it hits oxygen. Silence is the breakage of skin and the shedding of blood. And for those who hold the power of a mainstream voice, your followers are lost, lamenting the imminent return to real life. Deaf, dumb, and blind, so they will not return. I just want you all to know I wrote that when I was 17 and I didn't know how to say the word lamenting until last week. How were you saying it? I was saying lamenting. <laughs> like laminating. Um, I wrote songs when I was 17 that I'm still really proud to perform. That, that you know, there's also this thing of, I, I don't know I don't know if you could write that poem now I don't in the I same way. There is there is shit you can do when you're a teenager that you can never do again. It's the and undeveloped brain. And sometimes it's the best shit. Because I actually like literally meditated on this this morning because I was like, is it silly for me to share something that I wrote when I was a teenager? And also, you know, I hadn't read that poem in like literally years until last week. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was like, it was, it was me trying to make sense of like the industry that I was stepping into and seeing how they were covering the people that I belonged to. And it, it was this like cognitive dissonance that felt like nothing was fitting. No, the, the, the it just wasn't making sense. And so I, I was just thinking like this morning, wow, the power of an undeveloped brain that doesn't, doesn't really think about the consequences and just thinks about telling the truth over and over and over again. And you know, that's what we're here to do today. Uh, well, I've been contending, uh, con maybe contending is the wrong word. I've been revisiting my old band, uh, which has been my band all my life, right? The Dresden Dolls are putting out a new <laughs> record. Um, and uh, there's some really complicated things about this. And part of the complication has been as a woman who's now 47, uh, performing some songs that I wrote at 15, 18, 24, and like seeing if they still fit, s and s and and um, and in some instances, being ashamed of my now self that I'm not as honest as I was right. when I was 15, yeah. um, and then the flip side of writing these, like kind of being inspired by teenage Amanda and 25-year-old Amanda who just gave no fucks, and. And then writing this whole new album, like some of you may have heard it if you were at the Bowery, as I played seven songs. And I'm afraid of my own material. And I'm ashamed of myself that like the progress has come. You know, we become older, we become more conservative. And, and there's a good reason for that. And if you, you know, if you were at Sophie's uh, talk last week, we talked about how we actually need this whole ecosystem. We need 15-year-olds raging and screaming the truth and being like, wake the fuck up. And we need 95-year-old people being like, and, there, and there's also this. But um. doesn't, it, doesn't that show you, though, like the cycle that all of this exists in? Like I always, I in my brain, the way I think about it is like children have the truth and our elders have the truth. Everybody in the middle is just trying to like get back to the truth that we knew as children. And that's kind of like the, and that that's where we're at right now, which is why if you have any art that you like, 
created as a child, I don't even care if it's like a finger painting, like go back to it because it, it, you were telling your, like your adult self things that it needed to know. And it just makes things a lot easier when I always say to like my 12, I have a 12 year old brother and I'm just like, I need you to write that thing that you just said down. Like, I want you to remember that you're going to need, you're going to want to come back to this because somewhere along the line, we lose it. We like lose the, like, um, the confidence to just be, we get told that, you know, you can only show up a certain way. You can only speak about certain things. You can only like love a certain way. And I would love to know for you, because I remember when I first heard you perform upstate, you, you shared that song that you wrote when you were 15, which was really, can I, it was like about, it was referring to sexual assault and you shared it with your music teacher and his reaction was quite shit, in my opinion. Um, but you were 15 and you depicted an experience, which by the way, like was an experience that I had a very similar one when I was 15. And so like I was in the room just sobbing and I was just like, I didn't know you could even say those things out loud. So what did you, what did like 15 year old Amanda know that 47 year old Amanda is trying to figure out again? Um. Well, so the uh, we're gonna get very truthy tonight. I, I like we like, already like made a really this. out loud. Like people were like, "What does telling the truth on yourself mean?" I was like, "Oh, you'll know when you're here." Um, I'm gonna try yeah. to be more truthful than usual, which for me is a challenge. Um, I I wrote this song at 15. It's called Slide, and um, I actually I don't remember writing a lot of songs. Like, I, this song that I played for you today, I don't remember where I was when I wrote it. I don't rem even remember what city I was in, what house I was in. Um, I have very little, I have very few memories specifically of writing songs, and my memory's bad in general. I specifically, I not only remember writing this song, I remember the marker, the gray Pentel marker with which I wrote it. Um, and it and like a lot of good songs and poems, it came out in one go. And um, I it, I was you know in high school, tenth grade, living at home um, and in my bedroom. And I snuck down to the piano in the living room because I I knew how I wanted it to sound and I had to play it quietly enough that I wouldn't get in trouble because my parents were asleep and they did not I was not allowed to play the piano late at night. Um, and I was unlocking at 15 uh, and, and being taught by the bands that I was listening to, the songwriters that I was listening to, Depeche Mode and The Cure and Nick Cave and Leonard Cohen and PJ Harvey, uh, how it worked. And how it works is something terrible happens to you mm. and you take a metaphor and you talk about it. And that's how you make a song. Like this was wh what I was learning by the master chefs of songwriting. Uh, you don't write a song and say I was raped. That's boring and bad and also like won't work in a lot of ways. What you have to do is write a song about being raped that's interesting and beautiful. Where you're like talking around it but not talking about it? Yes, and also that makes you an artist. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm an artist. I'm a songwriter. I want to be Robert Smith. So what does Robert Smith do? Robert Smith takes a metaphor. It's a caterpillar. It's a bed. It's a cloud. It's a flower. It's, a, you know, it's basic. This is also the shit that we were taught in third grade English. Um, and, uh, and I was like, I know what a great metaphor would be. A slide in a playground. It has a top, it has a bottom, it has a beginning and an end. I'm gonna write a song about a girl who starts at the top of the slide and goes to the bottom and there's a scary man waiting there. And this will be the song about sexual assault. It's perfect. I am an artist um, with my gray magic marker. Uh, and I'm still impressed by that song. I still look back at that little 15 year old girl and I'm like, that's a good song. Like, go you. But also, I was listening to the masters. I was, I was paying attention to what resonated with me when I heard it with my ears. And, um, and the, the comment that the music teacher made when I was in a, uh, I, was, I had like a, you know, a, um, a, a bit of a music a, a teacher mentor. And I, this was the first song that I had ever written that I thought was good. 
and I had written lots of songs. And I was like, I think this is good. I think this is good. And I played it for him. Uh, and he said, I got to the end of it. I was so scared. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my entire life. I was like, this is it. This makes or breaks me as, a, as an artist. And he said, it's going to be amazing when your lyrical abilities catch up with, when your musical abilities catch up with your lyrical abilities. Uh, Imagine you just <laughs> shared <laughs> your sexual assault with a teacher and that's their response. I mean, you can laugh about it now, but that's wild. I don't even think he got what the song was about. Oh. Ah. Men. Men. <laughs> um, I picked the wrong teacher. I should have picked my English teacher. I should have. But then you wouldn't have I had the story. I should have picked Peggy Dyro. Uh, God, Peggy, I'm sorry. No, that I wouldn't have the story and I wouldn't have things to, to, to rage against. And you know what's funny? This is actually, this is an important part of the story and I've never really deeply thought about or told this part of the story. But I wasn't angry at him because I was 15 and he was the teacher. And this was also right in a, um, you know, era of my life where two of my piano teachers who were much older than me tried to sleep with me and I, and I did. And I, I was lost in the realm of like, of course the adults know. The adults know everything. Uh, he's right. You know, I must try harder. Uh, it never occurred to me to be upset until way later. But I was like, what a fuck? What are you doing? What you mean you way later, like when your brain became fully developed and it finally closed the circuit? Have you guys had that experience, like post-26 years old, where past, like, childhood teenage stuff goes, oh, that's what that was. That yes. Raise your hand. I, like, want to know if we were the only Yeah, okay, got it. Cool. Okay, but I have a question about this. Because, so, you're... The going back to like what um all the masters and the metaphors and blah blah blah. Okay, zooming out a little bit, do you feel like in a way some of these artists were avoiding the truthiest truth? Like they were just trying to like mask it with like metaphor and poetry and stuff because they actually themselves were like, I'm not gonna go with that deep. I'm not gonna feel that and my audience is satisfied enough with the metaphor. No. You think that they do feel it all the uh, way? I think it's two things. Great. Number one, telling the direct truth about incredible pain is it, it's a it's it's a bit of a fire hose, and maybe not useful in an artistic setting. Like, there are spoken word poems where someone stands up and is like, I was raped! And you're like, wow, that's powerful. But that's different. It's a different, uh, it's a different avenue. And maybe way more importantly, art, when you art your pain, when you use a metaphor, when you create a story, when you transmute uh, a trauma, a pain, uh, a sorrow, um, I mean, I know we're talking about all the negative things, but like throw in the positive things too, you know, an, an unbridled joy. And you don't just stand there and go like, I'm so happy. Like, it, it taps into the magical, alchemical thing that art can do that none of us have ever really been able to explain. And hopefully we never can. Because then it, it's, a, it's a different kind of invitation to a viewer, to a listener, to, to the person who's being presented with the piece of art. It's almost like every, every human from the dawn of time understands that if you take something and you package it, in an artistic package, in a painting, in a song, in a dance, in a, in a story, and then you send it over to your fellow human being, it somehow works. It somehow works in a more powerful way 
than if you just give the information directly. And there have been a lot of studies about how we take on information, how we store information, how we remember why stories are so important for memory. And um, I think I think both things are true because I look at the work of uh, really powerful artists, especially traumatized artists. Many artists like work straight out of their trauma and need to set it all on another planet for a reason. And 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 this gets into what we yeah, should yeah. talk about, which is like, what's at stake if you're just gonna tell the direct truth? And yeah. usually there's a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ugh, what an artist perspective. Um, as a journalist, it's a little bit different. I'm just like direct. But so, okay, I understand the need to like alchemize the trauma and the pain to turn it into art that's digestible and movable, something that you feel more in your bones and spirit than you do like just on the surface level. And and um, a friend of mine who is an amazing writer, Mari Andrew, um, I interviewed her and she mentioned how like sometimes like just talking about unprocessed trauma isn't even like productive. You have to kind of like move through it to get to the the beauty, to get to the reason that it's it's worth being shared in that moment. Can how can um, non-traditional, like non-artists or non-musicians engage with the music that we consume and like know when an artist has actually done the work to process versus spiritually bypass and just like get to the thing? I think that that's like really what I'm trying to get at is like I get that we don't you don't have to sit there and like directly say but I still want to be engaging with a person's truthiest truth even if it is powerful and beautiful and metaphorical and I think that like one of the things that happens now especially with social media where you're seeing more of like the insides of like your favorite artists minds sometimes you're like you ain't shit like Sometimes you just say stuff and I'm like, I really prefer your, <laughs> you're like not, you're like, yeah, I've noticed that lately. Like, I prefer the lyrics. So how do you, how can you like, <laughs> you know, how do we, how do yes. we still engage with the artist that way? Oh, well, that's such a great question. And, um, you know, I don't know how I would have felt at 15 if Robert Smith had been tweeting. Ser seriously. <laughs> and I, I kind of love that Robert Smith and PJ Harvey uh, have just never entered the arena of, and let me tell you a little bit more about myself, fucking ever, really. Back then there were magazine interviews and you would read those, uh, you know, I would pore over interviews with Robert Smith trying to glean mm. more information that I could apply to the man I was certain I would marry. <laughs> 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 um, but this is the thing, and, uh, and this gets it, I mean, this gets into a whole other conversation about the, the artist and the art and, and what our job is if we have a job to separate these two things because, oh my God, Nowadays, it's super complicated. And I, I think it's so dangerous to expect our artists to be good, pure, correct. Because that's not what art is about. And and of course, like anyone choosing to be an artist is fucking batshit to begin with. It's such <laughs> a, it's such a weird job, uh, especially to do as a profession, right? To make money and pay your rent being an artist, like it's strange on a million levels, and and it almost is like we're 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 on the flip side of the way a, a certain uh, segment of let's say a certain segment of at least American culture in the 60s expected their artists to be badly behaved. Yeah. And now we expect our artists to be, you know. What happened? I, you tell me. Is it social I don't media? Know. Is it social media? Is it accountability? Is it that now we realize, man, there was a lot of harm that was being done and we don't want to tolerate that? Yes. I think yes and um, but I want to know, like, your, like, when uh, when did you transition from, like, being, like, 
I can do whatever I want, blah, 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 sex, drugs, rock and roll vibe to like, oh. Well, I was never in a sex, <laughs> drugs, and rock and roll band because. Uh, vibe. It's a vibe. Well, also, I was a woman. Yeah. No one really wanted or expected Amanda Palmer of the Dresden Dolls, 25, to be, you know, in the back s- backstage doing coke, fucking the groupies. Right. No one looked yeah. at me and said, of course that's what you're going to do. You're a rock star. Uh, no, one knew, no one knew what to make of me. People were confused. I think it's still confusing. And... Um, and, you know, the fact that I was in a band with a man really helped. I spoke about this one night at the Bowery, that if I had been a f- just a female solo singer-songwriter banging a- on a piano, I would have had a completely different relationship with the media, a completely different audience, a completely different demographic. You know, I would have been a more punk Tori Amos type. But because I was on stage with a dude, and this is no disrespect for Brian, this is only respect for Brian the drummer in The Dolls. He's so amazing. He is amazing. He, because patriarchy, he absolutely authenticated me, because while I was banging on the piano, singing my truth, and my songs about sexual assault, and mental health, and confusion, and anger, a man was right there, hitting a thing, basically (laughs) said, (laughs) <laughs> basically saying, listen to her. Wow, yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what the band was, is. Yeah, it's fire. And so our audience was half male because also, like, it was not uncool to go see the Dresden Dolls because there was a boy and a girl, <laughs> and it wasn't scary. But it was also, like, punk rock cabaret, which is its own, like, very niche, like, experience. I feel like you're going to, like, a dark circus show when you're going to dress and guys i've i like have gone to uh, i've l- i've watched you perform like three or four times in the last couple months so sorry so i'm very intimate with this uh with this process that's great um but there is a thing about uh i mean if you want to get back to the rock and roll like why why that all happened i mean i do think that like culture moved on in general you know g- total annihilation and ex- an excess and the idea of throwing a television out a dressing room window kind of lost its appeal, I think, when we also realized that it wasn't really helping matters. And, you know, people still have so much romance around musicians, artists, poets, what it means. And I have had my own you know, internalized romance around what an artist is supposed to be, look like, act like, you know, speak about. And um, a lot of it is really unhealthy, still, in both directions. You know, that we're supposed to, especially our relationship with money, our relationship, uh, you know, with... Let's talk about that. I love, I want to talk about money with you. Let's do it. So sexy. (laughs) Yeah. Amanda, I've never met anybody who, like, can openly talk about money the way that Amanda does. Raise your hand if you're a patron of her Patreon. Wow. That's, you guys are so loyal. We got to find people like you. Thank you. Um, I think that it's so incredible. So your, like, Patreon, your community is, that's, like, a huge foundational part of just how you make a living, right? It's how I make my it living. It is how you make your living. And... I want to know, like, what your relationship with money was when you were purely only making money from, like, touring, on the record label, blah, 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 and then trusting that you had enough of a community to actually be like, you know what, I actually want to, I want to be, like, on your team. They, they, it's it's essentially, I don't, what's the word for, like, when people co-own? Like when everybody's a part of the business, kind of that vibe. Shareholder, Shareholder. yeah, shareholder vibe and co-op, all of the same. Yeah, that. So, how did you transition from that? Because I also I feel like with when it comes to like labels and making money through streaming and making money through tours, I mean, most of my friends who are artists like really, really struggle. No matter how successful they look on the outside, it's so hard. And so, what was that transition like for you? 
Uh, well, this is a very apt conversation right now because musicians especially um, are freaking out, freaking out at their inability to make ends meet because the math just isn't working anymore. Streaming isn't paying enough money and it used to be that you could make up the shortfall. People are no longer dropping 20 bucks on a CD, so you can't really make money from an album that way the way you could 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and it used to be that you would make up for the shortfall touring merch, and now touring has become too expensive. Price of gas, price of lodging, price of crew, COVID cancellations, whatever. Um, and unless you're the 1%, unless you're Taylor Swift, U2, Billie Eilish, Phoebe Bridgers, you know, you've like, you've, you've raced ahead of the pack and you've figured it out and you're playing to thousands and thousands of people every night, you cannot make a living. And to, to back up to the actual question, my veer towards crowdfunding was actually more about my disillusionment with my record label and the music industry than about uh, a, you know a, di a direct um, what do I want to say I I wound up crowdfunding because it was the only alternative I saw to the way I was supposed to be doing it. Can you like take us back to the first t time you had the idea and how uncomfortable it was in your body or how comfortable it was like when you were like, wait about, what about this? I was just excited. Really? But I am, uh, I am a famously optimistically naive person, which is maybe why these things occasionally work because I had no doubts. <laughs> I was so, I was so, um, there's a word for that, not cavalier, but like, I was I was sure, I was confident. Um, With a little delusion, probably because it just you but need also the magic of delusion. Here, the magic key is when you're that confident and deluded, everyone follows you <laughs> because they they're convinced that you have it figured out because you think you do, and so it goes. So um, wait, can I I want to ask? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you like you? So you're a patron of Amanda's. Can I ask you why and like how that happened? Oh yeah, take. Are you comfortable with that? Well, take 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 my mic. Oh, okay. Let me. I, I mean, I'm gonna try and make it concise, but I it was maybe I don't know ten or twelve years ago I discovered you and and I, I'm 64 now and I I hadn't cared about music the way I did when I was younger for a long time, mm. and I. I just, I saw... Wait, what's your name? Molly. Molly. Hi, Molly. Hi. And I saw the video of, fuck, I can't remember the name of the song, but um, the one about your family, the... Runs in the Family. Runs in the Family. And it just went right to my soul, right to everything about my childhood and, and healing and trauma and s therapy and everything. And I just embraced it. So that I just followed your career at that point, and then I just feel like you're a kindred spirit, and I need to support that in whatever way I could. Thank you. I feel like the second you. you hear from a p like from people like Molly, it gives me so much hope in community and building community. I feel like so much we have like. We see like the numbers on our screens. We see people as numbers. I mean, and, and the seeing people as numbers, period, in general, has become like a plague amongst humanity in general. And that's why it's so important to come to things like this, to be able to like make eye contact with people and be like, I see you. I'll never forget you, Molly. Like, thank you for sharing that. I will never forget you. It's I'm so serious. Like that to me, it's it's so important to like to be in community and to be gathering because it gives me hope that like Maybe we don't need the systems. Maybe we just need each other. So this is such an important thing to talk about right now as Twitter is collapsing. And What's uh, that? 
Exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, I refuse and, to go back and there. Literally, as this week, I mean, I just ran into Sophie in the street this morning, and I've been talking to Nora about it. I I have seen an activity and a lack of activity on the internet. By the internet, I mean Facebook and Instagram. Uh, this week that I've <laughs> never seen before. I have Amanda found out I'm heavily censored on the interwebs. Well, wh and also, who knows? We are left in the dark about why things happen and how they happen, and the algorithm is getting more and more frightening to artists. To, to I think probably to all human beings, but for we who have used that as a medium to like, oh, we'll take control, we'll talk directly to our communities, we will use these amazing internet tools and we will grow our followings and people like Molly will come into my community on Facebook and I will be able to tell you that I've put out a new song about New Zealand and I'm going on tour there and then I put it up on the internet and it just reaches nobody. Yeah. And the fear that is involved in that is not unlike the fear and the anger that I felt when I was on the major label where I was like, wait a second, I'm really not in control here. Yeah. I am not fucking in control and you don't actually care about me and Molly and our relationship. You give no fucks. You kind of have to give no fucks. You're a corporation, you're a company, you have to make fourth quarter, but I don't want to be involved. I just want to make music and give it to people who want it. Well, because it becomes an entire other job. But by the way, like if you're being an artist is one job, but like cultivating and keeping up with a community, like the fact that you're doing like these regular webinars and Zooms and gatherings in person and all that stuff, like it, ta it takes a lot to do that. It takes so much energy and it, it, it makes it m becomes very hard to turn off. I feel like with when it comes to like the whole algorithm stuff, like, as, I mean, I've been very um, vocal in reporting about what's happening in Palestine, and I have obviously, like, seen the censoring that's happening, and I'll have people be like, oh, your thing isn't showing up, oh, this isn't happening, blah, blah, blah. And I I see how people react to that, and they take it like, this, is, this thing is happening to me, and it's directly, like, um, I'm directly being censored and all of that, and I just, for me personally, it feels like, a waste of energy because I, I I feel like if you choose to use the internet as your medium, you just have to engage in a level of trust to be like, whoever sees this story is who's meant to see this story. Whoever like sees this invitation to the event is meant to see this. I mean, even with this event, like every single person who's in this room is exactly who's meant to be in this room. And we're all so happy and honored that like it was you that came. And the rest of it, I feel like it's just a series of like letting go. But once it becomes like, Part as somebody who also like m makes money off of social media, and I s I don't have a Patreon anymore, but like I'm building a media company outside of the system of traditional media, and so it um, it feels like y I I don't know. I would actually love to like throw this question to somebody in the audience. I'd love to know from you how you engage. Yeah, you have pretty hair, so <laughs> um, just like how how like how do you want to engage with stories online? Like, where are you looking to, to for your stories, for your news, for your truths? Um, I mean, I think she's just really good at this. Oh, sorry. Um, also, I, I loved your necklace. Oh, thank you. It's huge and obnoxious, <laughs> as it's supposed to be. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I actually appreciate you bringing up that point because I, I have a dear friend of mine who also was in the Arab Springs and is also finding a lot of his stories about Palestine are being censored. So I am definitely mindful of that. So I definitely try to get, like, my sources from a variety of things. And I use Instagram a lot. Um, so that is part of it. But I do try to go closer to the source um, for these Do you, issues. like, enjoy following, like, independent journalists? We were having this conversation yeah. before the event, actually. Like, even when I wrote that poem, and I was only a couple of years into my journalism career, whenever people would ask me, like, who are the news sources you follow, I would, no matter, like, even... 12 years ago, I would say, I don't, I don't just like, I will never say I blatantly just follow CNN or follow New York Times. I say, I follow and engage with independent journalists who have built trust with me. 
as a, as a consumer of stories, you have shown me your transparency, you have shown me your intention, you have interrogated your own biases in your stories, like, and as people who are, you know, misrepresented, I feel like you end up learning that the hard way because you realize there is no such thing as true objectivity until you do self-interrogation. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, actually, same thing with that friend I mentioned, um, I engage in conversation with him almost daily at this point about what's going on because I know he will interrogate me and that he will not let a single thing I say, you know, get by without him commentating on it. So for me, it's a lot of, some of it's firsthand. Like I just go straight to my friends that are in Israel or here and there. And then other times, yeah, maybe more independent journalists um, that I am uh, like at this point come to trust or I'll just do like the bigger ones like Haaretz or Al Jazeera for those live um, yeah. updates. But something about them too is they unlike a lot of like instagram things they'll name their source and you kind of go from there yeah so yeah i definitely kind of do case by case but i try to give it a variety do you find that anything is missing in the way that you're consuming stories where you're like i wish i i wish there was a little more of this empathy <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> oh thank you what was your name melissa melissa thanks melissa um i want to push back on something you said. Okay. I um, love that. I love that. I love this game. Yeah. Uh, I think, well, and, and, and I think it's a good conversation because I, I wholeheartedly agree with you at some level that we are always meant to be where we are and that yeah. whatever the algorithm winds up pinballing <sighs> synchronistically into existence is what it is. And yeah, tell me. Ugh. I need this. Um, we have to fight for direct and more authentic and more integrated connection. Yeah. Because if we just passively allow the the algorithm to take us where we need to be we are only in a profit-centered situation. And it's, it's more dangerous now, and I think we're all starting to understand what we didn't know 20 years ago, maybe about the internet, even though a lot of, um, uh, what, what do you call those people who are like, no, uh, well, Virtue uh, signalists? The alarmists. Well, I mean, they weren't the alarmists. They were the people that I remember, you know, reading about and seeing in the early days of the internet who were like, eh, this is not, this isn't quite going to work the way you think. This, well. Wow, we're really good at language in this room. <laughs> whistleblowers. Well, I mean, the prescient, like, the, the seers who could see the way the internet is designed isn't going to be sustainable the way you think. Yeah. It is going to turn into a profit-centric, non-egalitarian problem. But it already has. Like, that's what I'm saying. I, I hear you on all of this. When I say that, like, I feel like I just have to trust whoever gets it is going to get it, it's because, like, it was debilitating to have to care and to be like, what this this post only got like reached like 300 400 1000 people but like how many people are in this room probably less than 100 you guys are a lot of people like i'm good with that yes. there's like you know yeah. i well you kind of have to do both because putting information in any way out into the world whether it's independently on a radio station uh through a magazine through through any broadcasting channel at all is faith based and then you kind of, as, as an artist, as a journalist, as a person who wants to create something and share it with the world, it is always a little bit faith-based. But there is a, um, I mean, there is an incredible danger um, to just allowing the algorithm to do its work. And I irritate, I assume, I irritate the fuck out of my community by constantly banging on constantly banging on about how I need your email. 
I want to be able to reach you when Facebook melts, when Instagram melts, yeah, when the you know when the algorithm decides we're just not going to push any of Amanda Palmer or the Dresden Dolls information this month for whatever mysterious reason. I have to have another way of reaching you directly. So please, for the love of God, give me your email so I can <laughs> find you when I have a tour. And I say it every week on some post. But does anybody another. actually find that annoying? I, I don't feel know like if you would tell so me. Sincere. No, I feel like they would tell you. But does anybody have a suggestion of, oh my gosh, hi. Sorry, I just saw a friend. Um, uh, does anybody have a suggestion on, like, if we were to move off of social media, like, what's next? Like, how do we actually connect with you all? How do we make this happen? Yes, I would love to hear from you. And tell us your name, please. Oh, right here. Yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Um, I want a publicly owned public space because Twitter isn't public space and Facebook isn't public wow. space. Like, I want a virtual, a actually publicly idea. owned open source space because wow. the reason we keep on absorbing into the atmosphere is that every tech bro solution is not publicly owned. It is not open source and it is always going to end up needing to make money to exist because actually the data to run Twitter, whether it sucks or not, or Facebook or Google is so utterly insane it's me melting the ice caps. So we do have to actually invest while we're investing in like all the other climate solutions, how to own digital space in the way that we own a park yeah. because it is actually possible. Or the, or the, or the postal system. Or sure. the road system. Right, like, yeah, like, the trust yeah. in email is an example of, like, actually, my email address is the closest thing to a physical address that is about right. me as a person instead of me as a commodity. Because sending mail has always been a thing. We've been writing letters to each other since before we had written language. Yeah. <laughs> or trying to. Anyway. But, Jack, that's do a you great think point. that, do you think that if this space were to exist, that humanity would surprise us and actually be like kind and make it like no I, honestly because i'm just like yes in an ideal utopia world like i love it when you first said that i thought of an actual physical space what what do you think yes well and and let me add like there are lots and lots and lots of people out there working on technology to moderate and regulate public space. And um, we all know that we need the tools the same way um, the, the, you know, the mail needs to be safe and you're, you're, you can't just stick a bomb in the mail to your neighbor. It's illegal. You can't, you know, and like the roads need to be safe, the water needs to be safe, the social media space also needs to be safe. One of the things, one of the things that, that I think about is that we're all the commodity. Okay, yeah. and, if, and in, in the Postal Service, we're not the commodity, we're the customer. And we pay for that, we pay for every letter. We pay for the salaries through our taxes of the postmen and the trucks and all that kind of stuff. And we need a social media where we again are the customer, not the commodity. We're yeah. not the profit center. Five cents per angry comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. That's a good one. I have a question for Amanda. So. With Patreon and patron-funded work, um, what do we need all of us as music listeners and consumers to rethink? Because I think about when Napster came out and it was like not okay, but now everything is Napster and we can just pay a fee for all of the music. And like in 20 years, suddenly it's okay and everything changed. But in order to be a patron, I'm sort of paying a Spotify subscription fee to each individual artist I like. So. What would you encourage all of us to rethink with our relationship with how we pay for art and consume art? Uh, that's such a good question. Um, there's, well, there's several answers there. There's like my pie in the sky, if it were all perfect. I mean, my pie in the sky, if it were all perfect, is that w there would be some incredible blockchain technology that would follow any song anywhere it went. Um, people would pay 
um, you know, some kind of premium for the privilege always of listening to music and consuming art, but it wouldn't feel like it was breaking anyone's personal bank, but the money would always come back, not only to like the performer, but the bass player and the engineer and like everyone who helped in the creation of this art, like if the art then goes out to constantly live a life where it's constantly appreciated and constantly enjoyed, then there would be a constant stream of income back to the creators. Like how incredible would that be if that were possible? Um, and right now there's a very sloppy system of, you know, there's ASCAP and there's BMI and a song, you know, and there's mechanicals and stuff. And if you write a huge hit song, you'll see this kind of vague residual, you know, trickle down of we think the song is getting played and enjoyed by people, so here's some money. But it's really inexact, really sloppy, and really doesn't, isn't very effective. Um, the, the real answer to your question is that and I mean, my TED talk was about this, and my book was about this. Like, we need a, a we need a, a complete societal rehab about the way the relationship we have with the value of art and artists, because we really do expect it to just be there. We just expect it to be there. We expect to be able to open a device and just go. It's all free without really understanding that There's also like an intense pressure on artists and storytellers to provide it for free. Like I closed my Patreon after three months because I felt so guilt ridden for like taking money from That's people. your problem. No, it hundred <laughs> No, I'm saying that because it, yes. it absolutely is no, my problem. I couldn't move through well that. Well, and so the 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 evil twin of flipping your computer open and just going like of course all art will be free, all images will be free, everything will just be free free free, yay the internet. It is it 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 goes hand in hand with this other insidious problem that artists should just feel gratitude that someone even just wants to enjoy their work. Yeah. And it's like, ugh! Like, people really don't understand the mechanics of having the time, energy, and inspiration to write a song and then learn how to write the song, play the song, record the song, get the song into your laptop so you can listen to it. I think people highly educate, I'm getting up, Highly educated people still think it kind of happens magically and that the artists are just happy. <laughs> and that the artists should just be happy to have been in a recording studio to make their art and should just be happy to be being enjoyed. And uh, it doesn't sustain. You have to have an understanding around the cost of art and the cost of being an artist and like, it's weird, right? Because how do you measure the value of a song? How do you measure the value of a, a, a painting, a dance? You can't. So, you know, the artists have to call upon the audience to be generous and creative in their support. And, you know, with my Patreon, I write constantly about how weird and inexact and strange it is that like none of this really has a price tag and we can all kind of, I'm looking at Molly, we can all kind of agree it's all kind of made up, but guess what? So is the fucking art, right? Uh, so if you can enjoy the inexactness of my song and not be able to tell me exactly why it's making you feel what you feel or why it's good or why you want to listen to it, I can also say, I can't tell you exactly, you know, that you need to give me 15 or 50 or $500, but I can say, just give me something. I need the money to make the art. So give according to your ability. Give me what you can so that I can keep doing this. And it takes a huge amount of chutzpah to just say, like, I need your help. Yeah. I, I'm not going to tell you how much. I'm going to just say, like, give me five bucks or give me five grand. If you're really rich, I will, I will take it. <laughs> and 
And you, and like a lot of people watched what happened to me in 212 when I got up and I was like, just give me your money, I need to make a record. And I was excoriated. I was the most hated woman on the internet for begging for money for my record. So it, it went well, but it also was very expensive emotionally to get up and say that. Mm. Yeah. Name, please. Hi, I'm Lana. Hi, um, Anna. And, and the follow-up is for both of you. Uh, so where do you guys think the disconnect happens? Because none of us usual consumers expect to go to a coffee shop and get a coffee for free or go to a restaurant and get a meal for free or watch Netflix for free or cable TV yeah. for free. So uh, where do you guys think there is the disconnect of this intrinsical expectation that yeah. art needs to be free and it just needs to be available for us to enjoy at the expense of the artist, at the, at the suffering of the artist, that we need to be able to enjoy what is produced, and not only by artists, but also by, by journalists and like intellectual production, you know? Yeah. Like I've, I'm in academia, and there is also this notion that research needs to be readily available, that you don't need to pay for any content that is entertaining you <laughs> beyond the mass media that you're already paying for. Yeah. So, like, where do you guys see the breakage there? So, I I thought of two words when Amanda was talking, kind of like a kind of a breakthrough. And I'm so happy that you asked the question in that way. I think about what Melissa brought up about empathy, and the second thing is transparency. And as okay, so I oftentimes am funding my documentaries and my podcasts out of my pocket. Like, thank you so much for that support. Because <laughs> it, it hurts. And it's like, I always tell people, like, if you're going into journalism, you have to do that shit. Like, you have to, you would have to be willing to die for that because that is not going to make you any money. Like, I've always put my own money into my storytelling, but I've never been transparent about the fact that I do that. Like, I think that you guys are the first people that I've ever told that to. And I've always, wow, this is a breakthrough I'm having. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Um, I don't know why that like kind of makes me emotional, but I feel like part of it is like wanting to be legitimate and wanting to be seen as serious and, and, and at the caliber of CNN or MSNBC or whatever, but also like, I'm not trying to be like them. They are so uninteresting and honestly, honestly, they have failed us in so many ways. Like the, the I have literally stayed up for nights, for weeks, because I was so afraid to release a story that I thought about over and over and over again. Last year, I released a story for my investigative series called Rep, a story about the stories we tell. It's literally about the stories we tell. And it was about how the dehumanization of Palestinian people has led to the way that American people think and how it has shaped our culture and society. And I think I like thought myself sick for weeks for weeks I was so afraid to release this story. And I had to examine that fear in my body and be like, why am I so afraid to talk about the fact that I was so afraid to do this? And it's like that level of transparency to me is so sacred. If I don't find that in the stories I'm consuming, I am not interested anymore. I need you, I need to know that you actually care about telling the truth, that you are not imposing on me, that you are not trying to control me, that you're not trying to manipulate me, that you are simply seeing me as a human and wanting to tell the truth. And I feel like that level of transparency needs to be talked about. The amount of work and money that it goes in, that goes into these productions needs to be talked, I'm saying all this to myself, so thank you so much, <laughs> needs to be talked about. And then the level of empathy of like, here's, this is what I'm hearing. Because we can say all of this stuff in this room, and I know that, like, in this room, obviously, like, I trust and believe that nobody hates me, and I don't hate anybody, and, like, that's, like, the ground level at, at which we're entering. But for some reason, as, se as soon as we go on the internet, empathy doesn't exist, and we assume the very worst of everyone. So when Amanda here is telling you all that she crowdfunded for her, for, to make her album, we're all snapping and clapping, but the second she says that, online we're like who do you think you are and what are you going to do with every cent of that money and you're an artist why do you need to make a million dollars like that doesn't even make sense and all of a sudden and that that to me that lack of empathy is not a lack of empathy towards amanda it is a lack of empathy upon the person i think 
that we dehumanize ourselves before anybody and anything. And until we have done the work of interrogating our own stories, our own biases, the lens in which we see the world, we will never be able to tap into the empathy that is radical enough to actually create the world that we want to live in. And so the disconnect comes from, we need to be in spaces like this in person where we look each other in the eye, where we hug each other, where we hug strangers, where we say I love you and I see you no matter who you are, no matter what blood runs through your veins. And we also need to be like, and hey, by the way, I'm working on this project and I really think that you'd be a great fit. <laughs> and I'm just starting, just now, we're trying to, Side note and little announcement, we're trying to like revive, we're trying to bring back like the Oprah Phil Donahue style show. As you can see, you all are the guinea pigs. Um, and we're doing it ourselves. And we're trying to bring back like town hall discussions that exist like this where everybody can just speak freely. But I, I really feel like w as from what you're saying and from what you're saying that like it's gonna take us. It's just gonna take us and it's gonna take guts. It, that's going to be such an important medicine to the way the internet has uh, aloneed us. Like uh, the, the way the internet has seemingly superficially connected us, but has really uh, created a, a, a disorienting separation between people. And then COVID did not help. Um, so th th there's a second kind of more boring answer for you. Uh, just about the music industry, because you don't see things quite so bad in, say, the literary world. You know, people do expect to pay for a book, even if it's on a computer. And so, you know, wha why wouldn't that translate to people saying, like, well, of course I'm going to pay a dollar for this song or even 50 cents for this song. It's, it's a song. It has a value. And the, the, the boring... Uh, an unfortunate answer is like the music industry really fucked up. And when the, when the literary industry, the book industry, saw what happened to the music industry, they were like, oh no, oh no, 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 books will not be free. And everyone was like, okay. Except at the but library. Like it was too late for the songs. The songs were, li the songs were free. <laughs> And the books stayed caged on the shelf with a price tag, and everyone accepted it. Like, think about your biases. Think about whether or not how you would feel if you went onto the internet tomorrow, and every song that you expected to just flow freely in your car and while you were making breakfast and, you know, while you were at a party, all of a sudden, it was like, no, 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 every song that you listen to is going to cost you a quarter. You'd be pissed. Yeah, and then it, and then things change. So, like, the disconnect also was a failure of the industry, a huge failure of the industry. I'm Jackie. I'm talking Oh, it's again. Jackie again. Hi. Hi, Jackie. Um, I worked in an independent bookstore for three years. And so, like, yeah, books cost money and. Um, I think one of, and the reason why I wanted to respond specifically to the book thing, because I think one of the reasons we don't have a concept, like we have of books, of music, is that when you go to the coffee shop, when you go to the restaurant, when you, like, there's just free music playing. Like, you're playing, you're paying the barista for being your DJ to have a vibe in your favorite coffee shop. And the only place that doesn't really happen is in the library where they give you the books for free. So, like, it's a pretty, it's a pretty <laughs> weird, good point. right? Like, it's a pretty weird situation that we don't do ambiance without music. So, like, music as this thing that just happens, it has a little bit more of that. Yes. And then yes. I think that, on the like, yes, the, thank God the publishing industry tried at all to be an industry that wasn't gonna like stop having artists, right? And on the like, there is only one price you get to pay for a book. It is super regulated. That means most of your independent bookstores can't afford to be open because they can't actually pay a living wage because they cannot make any money that the publishers haven't decided they're making. And it is really, really hard to like, and I, and I wanted to bring that up because it goes back to like the independence, but also to like the public space, yeah. right? And like the notion that ownership isn't the only model and it can't be the only model when conglomerates have eaten the whole world. Agreed. Jackie, um, thank you. 
love hearing from you. Also, I, I've never really thought about the fact that the library is the, is the only place where you don't get free music, but you get free books. I just had a breakthrough. You mean you've never rented a CD or a tape from the library? No, just like it's a beautiful poem. That Honestly, it's like protect libraries at all costs. Libraries uh, are the most important thing. As a child, I, I, I'm like, I'm still obsessed with libraries, as a, especially because they have free crossword puzzles. Like, that's where you can get the free crossword puzzles. Um, as a child, it used to be like my biggest fear that libraries would one day make you pay for books because I was just, I remember thinking like, it's so important to have these books accessible. Accessibility is also a huge thing that I feel like for me is so important. Like, I've always felt like my stories are like, they feel, they feel like it feels like for me that they save lives. Like I, I did a, I produced a documentary about the sex trade. I spent four years investigating the sex trade, and I had, I remember one woman messaged me um, and said that she had realized that she was being trafficked, like sex trafficked, after listening to my podcast. And I sent it to my team, and I was like, if this woman was the only person who had listened to this story, that this is who it was for. And I feel like that has always really stayed with me. And so even when we do like um, want to, you know, charge for an event or whatever it is or for a virtual event or it, it's always I, I try to do like the sliding scale so that like if somebody cannot actually pay for this, you never have to. But if you can, like I, I would I want people to want to. That's like where I'm at. I, I haven't figured it out. I don't know. I don't know. But it just it feels tricky for me. Well, it is very tricky and I mean the the indulgent the indulgence that I ask from my patrons is please join me in this incredibly inexact exercise. Because a song will never be worth a dollar or a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. A song will just be a value and I and I need to live, eat and survive which is going to cost money, let's make a deal. <laughs> and, you, and you have to be very brave to say that because we live in a society that wants, to, that demands an exact etude around value. And man, just you just can't do it with art. It, and this, I mean, this gets into a whole conversation about like, can you put a value on parenting? Can you put a value on raising a child well instead of slaving away at something else? Um, and that is, you know, I think when we are able, I'm like looking at Adam again, when we're able to even talk about this and recognize what's going on, we're already miles ahead of where we are right now. Because I think so many people, so many smart people don't really think about where it comes from. Where, yeah. where, where, where the child rearing comes from, where the art comes from, you know, where the research comes from. And we are, we are spoiled right now. I mean, I feel like when we look back at this society, the embarrassment around us not understanding where things were coming from is gonna be the giant shame over this culture. But I think that that is changing and evolving. And the way that I'm seeing it right now is that, especially with, with Gen Z and even I even my, I would say myself like I'm completely reevaluating like where I put my dollars like I am actually asking like if you were to look at my outfit right now and ask me I, where I got everything I would be able to tell you where and why and how and the story behind it and I feel like people th and this is part of the like I want people to be excited to support my work I really 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 want them to be like I see myself in this I want to be a part of this too and I think that that is like it's gonna take a lot of guts from the storytellers and artists themselves. And you, you do that like really, really amazing. I don't know anybody who does it like the way that you do because you've made, you've been able to like actually live off of this. But well, let's bring the conversation back around to the beginning and the cost mm. of having any kind of power, platform, celebrity reach, um, because. It, it gets tricky once you have any when, once you have the mic once you have a power and platform because then telling the truth is you know it's very different than when you're just raging at 15 or 17 in your bedroom and you're just like y y you don't have a ton to lose and 
the well now you do if you're posting online as a teenager yeah that's true actually um but this is the like to me this is the juicy part of this conversation which is what what's i mean what's happening to someone like me someone like you doing work in like you know risky work in journalism i would call some of my work risky risky songwriting songwriting that takes risks and demands a lot of myself in the truth telling department and a lot from my audience in the accepting it department mm -hmm. um and I, I see the whole world turned upside down right now just in terms of what, what's allowed, what's expected, what's appropriate, um, what's punished, what's rewarded, in, in both in journalism and in music. And I think if we're, if we're gonna be having a really big, important conversation about this stuff, about the songs, about the art, about the journalism, um, the the thing, and I would love you to, to just riff on this and talk about it, we have to examine, and again, it comes back to the, you know, do we expect our artists to be pure, politically pure, pure of heart, you know, never make a mistake, never make a gaffe, never say something offensive on the internet. And um, it feels like right now truth is, has never been more expensive. Like the cost of, the risk of telling the truth is, is, it's like it's going up, it's like hitting a premium. And this has always been true and also depends who, when, where in history, which group, right? Because of course like people have been punished for telling certain kinds of truths from the beginning of time. And you know, I don't think either of us are going to leave this room frightened that we're gonna be arrested outside the Reuben and beheaded, right? But those times do exist and have existed and, and will continue to exist. So, yeah. I mean, what do, we, what do we think about that right now and what, what's the antidote? Raise your hand if you know for sure, if you have witnessed with your own two eyes exactly what happens after we die. No matter what you, you've seen. You just got a question. You have That's like just a, a really up. big. <laughs> Wait, can you, can you hold for the mic just because we're recording and we don't want it to get lost? I work in hospice and I'm death, I'm around death a lot. And I have a, I'm, I'm personally fascinated with death. And yeah. um, what I'm doing is I am preparing myself as much as I can for the, the ultimate moment of death, whatever yeah. it is. Yep. Um, but it's interesting you ask that because um, no, I mean I wish, I wish, right? I mean I, I wish uh, there is so much knowledge mm. and so much information mm. um, to uh, from that experience in itself, and it would be so amazing to come back and say, hey, you know. I've been there. <laughs> no. I would be very, no. very careful Let about wishing this. Uh, no, no, Can no. I share with you why I ask? Yeah. Because it's this question, this, this thing, this like obsession with death, this fear of dying, that I believe like we are at the place that we are today in the world. I think that if you were to peel this shit back over and over and over again, it's because people are trying to control what is going to happen after, what they choose to believe about what happens after, because most people and their convictions around that are very, very strong. And sometimes when you start to like hammer at it or pick at it and, and then you're like, yeah, but nobody actually knows. Like it, it kind of shakes people's worlds. And when I thought about this the first time, I blurted it out to a group of like 100 people um, I, I, I facilitated a 10-week program called Rep Club, which studied the investigative project I did. And the reason I, I ended up blurting it out was because my follow-up to that is, I believe that the, the reason that we are on this planet is to ask questions and to examine the concept of truth. Because at the end of the day, the one truth that is for sure for every single one of us, none of us actually have it. And so maybe the point isn't to actually know the singular truth of what happens after. Maybe the entire point is just to embark on what I like to call the quest of the question. 
to actually just go on the journey. And I feel like when to bring it back to like what you were saying around the cost of telling the truth. Yeah, sure. The cost of telling the truth is going to be expensive every time. But that is why we are alive. We are at a we are alive because we get to have the choice to put everything on the line to tell the truth. And this is what I realized in the last month as we've been seeing things happen is that there is there is a deep seated fear that people have around examining their own concept of truth and what they believe. And if you feel afraid, if you feel afraid to tell your truth or to witness the truth of another, then my question to you is, do you actually believe you are a free person? Because to me, my experience, why I want to be human is to experience true liberation, to experience what it really means to be a free, independent thinker and human exi- or soul existing in this like flesh suit that I happen to be wearing on this life. And I think that like telling the truth and engaging with the opportunity to tell the truth is like the whole point. I'm like, I'm, I'm down to lose everything if it means that I can say what I truly believe and what I have seen with my own eyes and to actually witness the people in front of me. I don't care. And that's why, and I feel like, I feel today standing on this stage before you all freer than I ever have in my entire life. And this has been the hardest year of my life. I have asked questions I never thought I could say out loud. It wasn't up, uh, up until May for the last 15 years of my life, I was covering my hair. And then I finally decided, you know what, maybe I should examine that. I don't know about that choice. Just right now, for me, right now. But it ripped apart my world and my reality. And I realized, oh, duh. Like, no matter how much people tell you that you are weak, that you have, that you lack faith, that you don't know what you're talking about, no, you actually have the answers and you have the opportunity and the birthright to ask questions. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, I just, um, I posted this the other day. I did a, a, bene- a benefit called Remembering Sinead a couple weeks ago here in New York at City Winery. And um, I didn't write a big speech beforehand, but I thought before I went on stage that evening about what I wanted to say. And um, watching you tonight and listening to what you just said makes me think so much about her, so much about her and what she said and what it cost and what happened. And uh, uh, one of the things that I said to the audience that night was it, it, it doesn't matter if people around you are telling you that you are brave you know, for getting up and shaking your fist and telling the truth and uh, ripping up a picture of the Pope or whatever. What what mattered, I think, in Sinead's case is that people told her she was brave, but she didn't get the call for the next gig. And she was also navigating the 90s, where her um, ability to directly reach anyone who loved her music was was in a stranglehold. And um, and I don't mean it at all disrespectfully when I when I wonder what would have happened with Sinead if she had had the tools that we have. If she had been able to say, you know what, like, fuck you record label, I didn't want you anyway. You know, fuck you, 90s equivalent of Live Nation, Ticketmaster, like whatever, whoever, you know, whatever promoters, agents, gatekeepers, all gatekeepers of every stage and every recording studio and every CD manufacturing plant, if she had been able to walk away from that with all of the goodwill that was felt towards her, all of the goodwill that was everywhere around the world that who wanted to hear her voice, her voice, her story, her take, if she had been able to directly reach those people, w- I think we would have had a very different artist. And we didn't get that. Yeah. And I think the, the appreciation that we should have right now and the responsibility that, that you have, that an audience has, a reader of news, of music, is to not take for granted 
the power that we can harness if we just do it together and we skip mm -hmm. over the the mainstream dictate the mainstream narrative and it really is as simple and as uncomfortable as nor saying i need you to sign up to my channel and here is how to do it and here is a pen well mm. a digital pen and like actually follow along mm. and me saying i want every single one of you to consider joining my patreon so that i can pay rent next month and make songs like the one you heard and you know this is going to fund the Dresden Dolls album and the money's not going to come from the sky it's mm. going to come from people like Molly it's going to come from you yeah. and if we can work on making the tools the fear at least from the artists and from the journalists around telling the truth and being buried by the system by the algorithm by whatever is going to lessen and the power of our connection and the power of the the, the truth and the sharing will grow, and then we will have progress. Mm. It goes without saying that I, I really believe that like us in our bodies and who we are today on this stage wouldn't, wouldn't be without the doors somebody like Sinead O'Connor opened. And um, I think, and, I, and everything Manda said just now, like I know we have it in us, like, I know we have the empathy. I know we have the ability to see one another. It's there. We feel it. It's such a funny thing, this whole empathy thing, because it's like every single time, every single time I see people face to face, that is the thing that they feel like they're desperately yearning for. But then the thing that we use the most that we pretend engages us with actual community, somehow it has completely lacked. And when Sinead passed, there was this brilliant, beautiful photo, which I wish I could hang in my house. It was a photo of her with her ha hair covered in a hijab while smoking a her cigarette. cigarette. Her face is a face of lifetimes that of, of, of pain and of journey and of self-interrogation and awareness that many of us will never know. And on that photo, somebody put, stop, stop treating, treating women, women like, like shit, shit while, while they're, they're alive. alive. <laughs> I love that. Good job. Oh my God. That and that's, that's it. That's said it all. That's it. It's yeah. just like we have it in us because every single time one of our favorite artists passes away, we're like, that's when we decide to write our eulogy, their eulogy, or we, we decide to tell them how much we love. Tell the people that you love that you love them now. If you appreciate someone's work, tell them. I promise you. And give them money. <laughs> that's what Amanda says. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, th I mean, I felt like we just both quoted "Stop treating women like shit that while was, they're that alive." Was a and good, that was, that a, was a good place to drop the mic. We have to wrap because we've already gone over time. We're not allowed to take like one question. I want to know their voices. One, one. Do we have time for one more Tell quickie them. question? Okay, Please. one more. One. Mo don't ask us the meaning of life. Just <laughs> a quickie. Um, Nora, who, what? Pick someone, and we'll run the mic out. Hi. Yes. Over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Desi, and I wanted to actually respond to Amanda. I've been a follower of the Dresden Dolls and Patreon and Kickstarters and all of that, and I don't pay for songs. I pay for your truth-telling. I pay for your wow. humanity. I pay for <laughs> the Thank connection. Um, and I think this is, this is the same. There's so, much of a, so many of us here who are voting not just with our money, but with our time, with our love. Because because you give us strength, because you make us feel less alone, because your humanity is a reflection of ours and it goes back and forth in this virtuous loop of connection. And so it's not about the commodity of the song. Yeah. It's about the relationality of what we create both here and online and everywhere. So please do ask us for money. We will give I will. whatever we can. <laughs> Well, and here is my ask, and this is a great way to, to wrap, is an ask from me and Noor and those like us who are willing to put our own money down, not work with the giant corporations, fund our own projects, risk our, you know, risk our own, uh, uh, you know, risk our own money in order to hope that on the other side, the support is going to be there to catch us. It 
it relies, the whole thing working relies on a shift of consciousness yeah. and a room full of people like this going like, all right, I'm going to follow Nora's channel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to consider being Amanda's patron even for a dollar. But more importantly, in discussion, at dinner tables, with coworkers, with friends, and on the internet, consider adding to the narrative. I saw that you liked this article. I saw that you're a fan of the Dresden Dolls. Do you support the Patreon? Do you give them money? I do, it's great. You should, you should consider that to continue to regularize, regular, normalize this, w what it is that at the end of the day we really need. Because at the end of the day, journalists, artists, independent anythings working outside of tech bro world and major label world and the, yeah. the, the total for-profit world, we need funding and it needs to be normal. And so a group of people like this going like, I'm gonna actually spend a little bit of time on that. I'm gonna talk to people about that. I'm going to address it. I'm gonna leave a comment and say, you know, how can we fund it? How can we help? How can I help? Do you need money? And if that shift in consciousness continues and Kickstarter bec you know, became normal, patronage hopefully becoming normal, this person can make a living. And eventually, like if the pile is big enough, you won't, you know, you'll just have 50 grand, 100 grand to be like, I've hired the team. We're going to investigate the story because the trust yeah. will be built over time the way the trust with an artist is built over time. So like, go be those people. This room, go be those people. I guess that's how people. we also get the art and the stories that we actually want. Like, we're all sitting here complaining about, like, the way that the media is running or, like, mainstream music as well. And I'm just like, yeah, well, then if you really want that, then you have to support the people who are willing to put everything on the line to be of service. And with that, I'm Noor Tejuri, at your service. Ciao. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I would just like to... Uh, I would like to thank the people, I know there are people who have come to every talk. I want to give one last huge shout out and thank you to the tech team and to Tim here at the event. Thank so you. this is incredible <laughs> conversation series. Every single one of these talks has been interesting and challenging and beautiful. And thank you to Nora for coming tonight. And thank you all. <laughs> Support the museum. And um, ple yeah, please come back to the museum and come back to more events. Like this didn't happen by accident. Tim invited us, so thank you. Well, and, and Amanda curated this series so exquisitely to give us facets of how we can responsibly and with awareness work through this world. And we've talked a lot about um, taking things for granted tonight. Um, and this conversation in a way has been a metaphor for the condition of the world, that we've taken our water sources for granted. We need to inquire where they come from. Uh, we to need to know what the application is of our responsibility and how the cost of being unaware bleeds out into a fractured society. Mm -hmm. And so, what has this got to do with the Rubin? Well, Noor and Amanda, you created a town hall tonight rather exquisitely having shared opinions and experiences. And that's exactly the experience that we want to encourage up on the sixth floor in the exhibition, Death Is Not The End, where you can share out your fears about death or you indeed your hope for the afterlife. So go and do that before you leave this house and uh, engage with these things that we fear because that's the only way we're gonna work through them and we've got two extraordinary exemplars on stage about how that can be done. Thank you both so, so much. <laughs>